Hey, Mr. Paul, Here we go, going live. Tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk, not thinking I was going to get to go live tonight, but here we are. So I'm kind of uh, excited to do that. Made a few miles to get here on time, but here we go. As a matter of fact, I thought I'd start off and just share that trip with you because there's some really, really interesting things. I see John Funk, Mike Cook. Good to see Mike. I talked to Mike on the phone the other day. So let's see here. I'm going to pull this up so I can see. John Funk, you're freezing. You know what? <laughs> uh... Yeah, yeah, and it's, I tell you, um, I left, let's see, I'm going to tell you all just real quick where I've been, what I've done, if you got questions, it'd be kind of fun to talk about that kind of stuff. John, you know what to do, it's hashtag Palm Boss Magazine, click like, share this video to your timeline, and you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat, and a Palm Boss Basic, Beyond the Basics book. However, this week... Leanne did a drawing, and she drew Ben Ship's name, and Ben's going to get a hat and a Kanga cooler from Easy Docs of Texas, David Schneiderman. There's Frank James, Michael Eric, Todd Austin, 80s last Sunday, and you're below freezing this morning. So, uh, man, I get that. So, last, I guess it was, I just tracked back to Friday, I went down south of Buffalo, Texas, and I looked at a site. Hello, Danny Mack. Hello, Kim Moore. Good to see you from Illinois. And I went um, down between halfway between Dallas and Houston to take a look at a at a site there. And this this guy was referred to me by an earth moving contractor that had just built a lake for another client that he referred me to. And so this is pretty interesting. This is on family farmland, kind of down, not quite in a floodplain, but just several feet above a floodplain, but it was flat land with some washes that go down into a, a valley that feed into a watershed. And the next door neighbor years ago had built a pond that backed up on this family's land. So they decided they wanted to build a lake right there where that water's backing up. So their dilemma was, how do you build a dam where there's water standing there? So they called the neighbor and to get his blessings to pump some water out he didn't like it, but he agreed to it because they promised to be able to put water back in his pond after they finished their dam. So they want to build this dam real close to their fence line. But, uh, and, and one of the problems I saw was they didn't have a way once the dam is built for water to leave the, the dam, leave the lake, and get back into the creek before it got to the neighbor. And what they were going to do was they were going to the earth moving contractor is going to raise the dam up high enough that there was a low spot about 200 yards back where water could go around and bypass that watershed and go down another creek and bypass the neighbor's pond right below them. So I said, you can't do that. If, if you do that, you're going to, you're inviting trouble. And so we had a, probably a 20 minute conversation about creating a siphon pipe in the middle of the dam. So when that lake is finished, it's going to be able to fill up and then overflow the primary rains into the neighbor's pond and keep him supplied with water. But otherwise, if I hadn't come, they wouldn't have done that. So it's the kind of stuff that my eyes see and their eyes see that we can combine and collaborate and do some pretty cool things. Now, the other thing was I always, when I go look at a lake site, I want somebody to flag the water line. Well, they had flagged one side of the water line, and I could see that this lake site was going to have a lot of water. It's, it's flat, 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 flat creek, and it goes down, and there's like three tributaries of that creek that drop off really quick. But if they were to leave that water shallow, it's going to grow a whole lot of vegetation, take up space that can't be productive for a good fishing lake. So we started brainstorming, came up with a plan to, to get up there where the shoreline is going to be, and either push some dirt out and make the shoreline more narrow or start hauling dirt out and create a stair step effect. So what they decided to do was to start moving some dirt out because a lot of it's topsoil and they can use it around the ranch and they've got two big dump trucks where they can haul it. So there was a whole lot of fun stuff going on at that point and uh, uh, it was very, very fruitful and productive. And now, I'm, now that I'm back, I'm going to sit down and work up a a habitat design program for them. 
So I'm going to tell you the other things that I got to do that are pretty fun. Let's see here. Robert Dyer, the wind finally stopped blowing in Nebraska. What's that like? <laughs> it's blowing everywhere, man. I got go, going up where I, where I went after that. Well, I'm, I'm going to stay in sequence. But, but after that site visit, I came back home, spent the night, got up early, early on Saturday morning and hooked it. No, that's not true. I did that on Thursday. Then on Friday, I was in the office a little bit. And then Saturday morning, I hoofed it down near Corsicana. And there's a, a property under contract. It's like 590 acres under contract. And the new buyer is from the Northeast. He's from uh, New England. And he doesn't know about recreational property. So he wanted, his realtor recommended me and he wants, wanted me to come in and evaluate the different ponds and water resources on that property. So when I got that call a week and a half ago or so, the first thing I do is I go on the map right and I start looking at the different maps, look at topography. And one of the things that just jumped out at me was there had been a lake built in the last couple of years right along a fence line, right in the middle of a watershed that's over 800 acres that feeds a flood prevention lake on the next our neighbor's property. So for some reason, the current owner wanted to build a lake in that watershed, and I looked at it, ran the math, calculated it, and I knew that dam had to have been blown out. So I called the realtor, and he said, you're absolutely right, that dam was blown out, but the landowner blamed it on one of the farmhands. I said, how do you blame that on a farmhand? He says, I don't know, but he fixed it. So I showed up there early Saturday morning, spent about two hours driving around this property, looking at the different creeks and and there were three ponds that started off as stock ponds that they've converted to fishing ponds. But then I looked at this big, bigger lake that's probably 20 acres when it's full and it's long and narrow. And the ranch manager said that he built it for his kids and grandkids to practice crew on. Well, it's long and narrow, shaped like a hockey stick. So I guess that could work if they could turn around, you know, but you, it was obvious that the dam had blown out. So they added another culvert. There were two uh, overflow pipes that are that are corrugated metal that are going to rot in 10 or 15 years. And they're both over six feet in diameter. And the pipes spitting the water out the backside, both of those are four feet in diameter. Then at each dam, I mean, each end of the dam, they've got two more big culverts. that are about 48 inches in diameter. So now they've at least accommodated the, uh, the overflow from this huge, huge watershed. Bottom line is they should have never built that lake. It's the wrong place. You don't build a dam parallel to a fence. You build it across a watershed and the dam needs to be built to where it can accommodate a hundred year flood. Now, if you don't know what a hundred year flood is, that is a flood that has the odds of happening in that area every hundred years. And it's typically defined by that geography. And that particular geography, I haven't looked it up, but I bet you a hundred year flood there is nine inches of rain over a 24 hour period. Whereas you go a hundred miles west, a hundred year flood might be a, a, a five inch rain over a 12 hour period or something. So anyway, there you go. Um, and then uh, I spent a little time on that and then I headed over to East Texas on Saturday morning, met up with several of the Palm Boss Forum guys who had a, an outing at Brian Hoffman's place. Brian Hoffman, his handle on the website forum, Palm Boss website forum, is High Flyer. He flies for FedEx, and so he hosts a deal every two or three years when we're not in a pandemic. And then folks show up, and they talk about their ponds. They fish his pond. He shows them all the cool gadgets that he's invented because he loves doing stuff with solar power. So we did that, and then I cut out about two that afternoon, and I drove to Miami, Oklahoma, spent the night there, and then I headed to Ainsworth, Iowa. So Michael Eric, I know I was not too far from you because I went up north and then cut due east to get to Ainsworth. I thought about it that day, but I needed to get where I was going so I didn't ring your number. But anyway, I was gonna go look at a lake Monday morning that I had designed, oh, almost nine or 10 months ago and now it has water in it. And it was fantastic. That owner had done everything that I asked him to. And plus some, he was pretty creative with his habitat. Now he put in, I told him to put in about 15 spawning beds for bluegill. I think there's 32. <laughs> so he, he's got more spawning beds than he needs. So forage fish won't be an issue in that lake. And 
He's now ready for fish. So the next thing we'll do is work on a stocking plan for him. And then after that, I left there and drove down and uh, uh, paid a visit to a fish hatchery and talked to them for a few minutes and then uh, headed down to Pacific. Actually, actually, let's see, that would have been, what night was that? That would have been Monday night. So then I headed down and stopped in. I got invited, Chuck Brinkman. I see Chuck's on there with Miranda and Elena. I stopped by their house, their mama, and they cooked a great supper. And I got to watch Miranda and Elena catch some fish. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, everybody should raise their kids like, like the Brinkmans are raising their girls. And I told them this, I said, you know, this is normal for you, but this isn't normal for everybody. And I love it. I love the fact that you guys are kicking it in gear and the girls love it. I mean, Elena wanted to get in the pond, but dad kind of had to throw the brakes on, hey, get out of the pond, back up. You know, and you can tell they love each other and they spend a lot of time together and watching Miranda and Elena catch some fish was really, really fun. So I enjoyed that evening. Then uh, yesterday morning, <clears throat> I stayed overnight in Pacific, Missouri, and then shot like six or seven videos with Purina Mills yesterday. Well, I figured we'd wrap that up by about noon. It took a little bit longer. And then I was gonna head over and see Fred and Connie Bingaman in St. Louis. But then I got the call. I got a call from uh, the landowner that I was gonna meet early this morning. And he, he'd gotten in early from his trip and he wanted to meet yesterday afternoon. Well, it was a three hour ride north, so I hooked it up there and got there before he did, and I shot a few videos. And after this show, look down on this feed and you'll see a video that I shot where he built a beach. And oh my gosh, and I've got some other photographs that I'm gonna post right after the show to show you some of the features that he's put in that six acre lake up there. Now this one is in Northeast Missouri. Um, well, I can't think of the little town where he is, but he's way up in northeast Missouri, probably 30 miles from the Iowa border. And we wrapped that up last night, oh, probably 7.45. So I climbed in my truck and I thought, you know what? If I hoof it, I can get somewhere, sleep a few hours, get home in time to do this show. So that's what I did. And Debbie said, now, what hotel are you going to stop at? Do not sleep in your truck. So I kind of winked at her over the phone. Okay, honey, sure, no problem. But I can't see renting a hotel room if I'm gonna be in it for about four or five hours. That didn't make any sense to me. So I just hoofed it, went due west, hit Interstate 35 about 60 miles north of Kansas City, just got on I-35. And if I got tired, I pulled over and went to sleep. Ended up sleeping five and a half hours, I think in three spurts, and got home in time to take a nap, and here we are. So that was some pretty good stuff right there. Pretty good stuff. And uh, when you see these pictures that I post, you're going to think, oh my gosh, I wish I'd have thought of that. So, let's see here. Yep, there's uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Cottrell. Hey, Mike, I'm going to be in um, Graham, Texas in the morning to give a speech. I think I, think I go on at 10 o'clock for the uh, extension AgriLife Extension Service there in Graham, north north of where you are, so that'd be kind of cool. Fred got his copy of Beyond the Basics yesterday, hoping you would stop by it on. I really wanted to do that, Fred. And I've got you a bottle of something that I found at the liquor store since you told me about Bell Mead, which I bought, and I've got one for you that's a special cast thing. It's a well-known brand, but I'm gonna get that to you here in a few weeks. Here's what Fred's talking about, Beyond the Basics. This is my fourth book, and it's $29.95, which seems high for a book, but you're not buying a book. You're buying 40 years worth of stuff that's been tucked in here, and I guarantee it'll help you. There's, there, are, there are good nuggets in this book. I'm really proud of this book, and I'm proud of it because I, I was able to convey things that you're not going to find anywhere else. You know, and, and it's gonna it's given some order and some process to how you think about pond management. So rather than sit here and promote my book, I'm just gonna tell you it's worth the money and it's and it's selling really good. We've sold, I think Leanne said we've sold over 40 copies in the last week or so. But in it, we talk about planning and building a perfect pond. And I don't here's the thing: this is fundamentals. We don't dig down into the depths 
of any of these topics, but what we do do with it, what I have done, is given you the information you need to know we pull, we're pulling the first layer off that onion so you'll know what questions to ask at the next level of that onion. So there you go. So Fred, I will sign that book. After you read it, tell me what you think about it or not. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, Frank James, 100-year flood means 1% chance of it happening each year. Can't happen two years in a row, and I've seen that. I've seen that a lot. Danny Mac, 30 inches in a day seems to happen often in Texas, twice even here in 98 and 02. That's no 100-year event. No, that's probably more like a 500-year flood. And when Hurricane Harvey came on and dumped so much water on top of Houston, that was a 1,000-year flood. So that was a big deal. Hello, Matt Marsden. Matt uh, is with American Fish Tree. He's got a new product coming out that he wants to test. And I've got... I've got somebody in mind that's just got through building a lake that I think would be a good candidate because the, the guys that built that lake didn't call me until they were finished. You know, they told me they were going to build it, which when, when somebody calls me and tells me they're going to build a lake, I like to get with them before they start construction or at the very beginning of the construction so I can see the different features so we can create the very best habitat uh, possible for that site. Well, by the time I get there, it was this gigantic cereal bowl with smooth slopes all the way around. They had consumed a dam of a small pond. There were about three or four feet of silt in it that they weren't going to take out. But all the rest of it, I mean, it was it was compacted clay, you know, a three-to-one slope, 12-foot wide crown on the dam, probably covers four acres or so. So then it was, okay, now there's no ledges, no ridges, no humps, no nothing, they had a bunch of tree limbs from pecan trees that they had saved. So how do you create a habitat plan for that? Well, that's going to be a lot of artificial structure. So uh, that's that's kind of how that deal works. <clears throat> Ainsworth, Iowa is in Mike Fornash's backyard. Well, this is a brand new lake. And this guy, I'm telling you, he's very, very thoughtful, conscientious, uh, he planned it for over two years before he pulled the trigger. And because you have to do some permitting, there's some permitting that has to be done in different states, and Iowa is a little more stringent than some. Not as stringent as others because he was able to get the permits that he needed, and it worked out really, really good. And uh, uh, he did an outstanding job. Now, he shot a bunch of video, and I'm going to try to get that video from him if I can figure out how to get it from his phone onto my laptop. So I get to Chico, who can edit it. So I'm not quite technologically savvy on that deal, but I'm going to work on it. So let's uh, let's go back. I tell you what, let's let's talk about Chuck Brinkman's pond for a minute. That pond, uh, it, it, the whole story is just very cool because things just fell into place for them to build that pond. There's Jim Nordquist. In your opinion, how much damage can otters do to the fish population in a small pond? We're talking one to two acre size pond, northern Illinois. They can they can end it. They can decimate it. They can eat every big fish in it, and they can do it fast. So if you've got otters, as cute as they are, as fun as they are to watch, as playful as they are, shoot them. Trap them. Give them their walking papers. Send them to heaven. Or if you want to be more humane, trap them and give them to a neighbor you don't like. <laughs> Just make sure it's about 40 miles away. Um, uh, but going back to, to Chuck Brinkman and, and his wife and daughters, they had a, a nice little swale, like a little creek right below their house. And as fate had it, there was a piece of heavy equipment that didn't need to be used. And Chuck was able to corner that equipment, and use it for a, a fairly, for a reasonable cost. So he built the pond and, you know, it wasn't that he really knew what he was going to do with it, that it was going to be a fishing pond or what, what not. But he built it, and then he figured out that he, the research that he did, he could stock some feed-trained fish. So he stocked some bluegill and some channel catfish, and he stocked some feed-trained largemouth bass. And uh, he, he trades with Strotman Feed Company there in Union, Missouri, and that's where he trades. So they kind of conspired to figure out what kinds of feed to use and when, and Chuck just started pouring the feed to those fish. <clears throat> and boy, they grew, they grew fast. As a matter of fact, when I was up there one time, two or three years ago, Chuck, you might chime in whenever it was, 
Uh, but Chuck was a guest on this show because I was going to be there. I asked the Purina guys who would be good on the show. They said Strotman Feed Company. So they gave me their number and they said, you know what? Chuck's the guy. So Chuck came up and sat down with me and we did this show a couple, three years ago. And Chuck was telling me how fast his fish were growing. And then, of course, I don't know what happens to you on, on Christmas Eve, but I got pictures of fish from Chuck. <laughs> And that's maybe not quite true, but but I get uh, I get a lot of pictures from people, and I just love seeing those red-headed girls holding up a big blue gill and a smile wrapped from ear to ear, you know, or holding up a giant bass or a catfish. Well, uh, almost a year ago, Chuck called me, or he actually, yeah, he called me, and Debbie and I were babysitting the two rowdiest grandkids that we've got, R.E. Thompson. He's out, R. Thompson. I'll be get back to that story, but R.E. is uh, is on a motorcycle trip with his wife and another couple, and they're uh, they left this morning and they've headed up in the mountains where they're riding around and hanging out. And he texted me, to let me know he was going. He's in his mid eighties, and he manages ponds and he helps people that need it in recovery programs and stuff. And I love what you do, so I appreciate those kind words, and I'm glad you're here because. We're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit. And you guys are going to throw a few questions out here at me. But as, a, as a, uh, when Chuck called me, it was it was the Friday night of Memorial Day weekend. It was late in the day, like, I don't know, 730. And my phone's ringing, and I've got two grandkids crawling on me. Matter of fact, I wrote an article about it, either last issue, there I don't remember, one issue, two or three issues ago maybe. But um, those two grandsons were crawling on me. And that's what they do. I don't know what it is about me. I'm big and I'm crawlable and I like it. So they climb on me, you know, lay on my head, fart on me, stuff. It's just charming little kids. Well, it's the Lusk boys. And so, I mean, I'm wrestling with those. It's Debbie's stressing just a little bit. Oh my gosh, you know, how are we going to calm them down? Well, we're not. We're not. We're not going to medicate them. But what we can do is we can put them in front of the TV maybe in a minute we can give them something to eat. I don't care if it's healthy or not. I just want to keep them alive until their parents get back. And that was the first day of like a five-day road trip. They were, gonna, they were going to Napa for a well-deserved vacation. So my phone rang, and Debbie looked at me. She said, don't you answer that. Well, I looked, and it was Chuck Brinkman. And I thought, you know what? He's going to be calling me for a reason. He's not going to call me late in the evening on a Friday night of a holiday weekend unless something's up. So I did like my great Pyrenees dog that we used to have. I would give him a command and he would look at me and say, yeah, yeah, I know you want me to come here, but I really need to go over there and, and make sure those horses are where they belong. But you know what? I'll, I'll come over there. You know, oh no, boom. And then he's gone. Well, that's what I did to Debbie that night. <laughs> so I answered the phone and uh, it was Chuck. He says, hey, man, I got something strange going on. My fish are acting funny. And I said, tell me what it is. And so... His fish were coming up, gasping for air, and they were lingering around the edge of the water. And it wasn't like they were suffocating from, for lack of oxygen, but they were in distress. So I said, what does the water look like? Does it have an odor? And I asked him a few questions, and every answer he gave me told me that he had been feeding his fish so much that waste byproducts had been building up in the water and the water quality had deteriorated to the point, starting from the bottom coming up. I'll explain that. That's interesting for you to know. That it had gotten to the point where the fish couldn't tolerate it. So they're fishing in enough of, I mean, swimming in enough of their waste that it was actually burning their gills and it was getting ready to kill them. So I'm, I'm sure that that waste was consuming oxygen, but it was a combination of factors. Now, what happens is, is when you feed fish and and they consume it. Let's say you're feeding Purina MVP. They convert that feed 1.3 to one. So you get 1.3 pounds of feed into one pound of uh, into a uh, fish, and they're going to gain one pound. Well, now his channel cat had grown up to be really big. His bass were big, and his pond fish population and fish density had reached beyond its carrying capacity, and now it was pushing back by causing the water quality to, to deteriorate. So he said, what would you do? So I gave him a little recipe. I said, don't you have an aeration system? Yes, but 
I don't have power. I can't get it hooked up. You know, and, and it's, it's in a box somewhere in a warehouse. So I said, okay, uh, do you have a sump pump? Is there a Home Depot? I've got a sump pump. I said, all right, what you need to do is get a, a five gallon bucket, set that sump pump in a five gallon bucket, come out the top of the sump pump straight up and then turn at a 45 degree angle, choke the water down and start pumping water and spraying it. Don't choke it too much because you need to move volumes. And what you can do is you can start helping that water release those gases that are causing the, the problems with the fish. Well, by that time, he lost a few bluegills. So one of his running buddies came and started, his electrician came and started setting things up for him. He ran to Home Depot or the local um, lumber yard and got the PVC pipe that he needed to come back and configure it where he could start pumping water out over the top of that pond that probably covers a third of an acre. So he plugged in the pump and started spitting that water out and the fish stopped dying. Now they were still distressed really bad. So I said, one of the things you need to do is start calling some of those catfish. Get some of those. You're, you're at the point you need to harvest fish. You know, I preach all the time. Your pond is like a garden. You, you know, you're going to create, produce a crop. At some point, you've got to harvest a crop or nature's going to do it for you. And you're not going to like it. And that's what was happening to him. So as the water was being pumped, you know, picking it up out of the five-gallon bucket. Now, the reason I told him to put it in a bucket was so the pump wouldn't suck mud. If you set that sump pump on the bottom of the pond and you don't tie it into a bucket, it's going to tip over, it's going to suck up mud, whatever. So he put it in a bucket, anchored it in the bucket, water was flowing in the, in the bucket as he was sucking it out with the pump and blowing it out and aerating it. Now what the aeration did was, yes, it did add oxygen, but it also gave that pond, it sped up the process of it processing its wastes so it would clean the water up. And he left it on for a long, long time, and it, it cleaned it up. And he didn't lose any, any more fish. He lost a handful of really nice bluegills. And judging from the condition of the fish, when I was there, uh, what was it, Monday night, whatever. Yeah, no, yeah, hell, I'm lost. Yeah, Monday night. I don't know what day it is. I think it's, it's got to be Wednesday because we're doing this. So, anyway, those fish are in great shape. But, you, Chuck, you still need to be harvesting some fish, like some of those smaller bluegills, you know, and you know that. And Chuck weighs and measures his fish. He's checking their relative weights. So he's knowing that he needs to harvest fish and he's going to do that some. Hello, Ron Ardwan, Boudan Ardwan, Doug Cusick. Ron, uh, I used your pictures of the sick fish that you sent me and I wrote an article in the May June issue called Fish Afflictions. And uh, I tell you what, you guys, the next issue of Palm Boss, if you're not subscribing, you need to. It's 35 bucks a year. Listen, 35 bucks a year. Cheaper than a Friday night day. There it is right there. And it lasts a year. And there's nuggets. And this next issue has got some go-to articles that you're going to want to reference. There's a, a, a... Ron had told me about a fish pathologist at Mississippi State. I called and talked to him. Then I found one that's at Auburn University that's very excited. He wants to contribute articles to Pond Boss about fish health. And he's going to start doing that. So we've been having conversations. But in that next issue, in the May-June issue that's gone to the printer, uh, going to be mailed in four or five days, there's contact information on how to get in touch with these fish pathologists if you have some issues with your fish. So it is almost 7 o'clock, and we're going to take a minute and do a little commercial. I love Purina Mills. I went and shot several videos with those guys yesterday that they're going to use on living the farm life, I think, which those videos are typically three to five minutes long. They go out to the dealers, and the dealers put them on their social media pages. So if you've got a Purina dealer, you can click on their page. I think there's 400, I think you told me, Kurt Schultz told me there's, I think, 407 Purina dealers that get these videos, and they range in everything from well, whatever you can feed, horses, cattle, uh, show feeds, livestock, fish foods, wildlife. And then we shot a few short little vignettes for the uh, Purina Mills Facebook wildlife page. And that was pretty fun. Didn't, didn't take as long as I thought. Well, it took a little longer than I thought, but, but we got a lot done. Purina's got, they bought another piece of property with another lake on it. And I shot a little video that's right here on this page down below that shows the spillway for that lake. And I gave a little nugget about how spillways work. 
So you might want to check that out. Hello, Jacob West. Good to see you. Doug Cusick, good to see you guys. You guys know the drill. Hashtag Palm Balls Magazine. Click like or the little heart thing. I don't know if people do that on TV. Whatever. Little heart thing. There it went. There it goes. Somebody did it. I see it floating up there. And share this to your timeline. And you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Balls hat. Right there. There's a brand new one. Never been worn. And... I'm going to give away a few copies of Beyond the Basics, Fundamentals of Pond Management. So there you go. And, you know, David Nelson called me with Purina Mills as I was traveling last Saturday. And his question to me was, what can we do to improve what we do? That was his fundamental question. And so I started asking him some questions. Well, what, what do you see? as some of the obstacles that you may have. Actually, you know what? Frank James, Bob, we seem to be hearing more and more about possible food shortages. If we wish to tilt our ponds toward producing food more than sport fishing, what would be your recommendations? Okay, let me let me think about that a minute. Um, I don't see I don't see fish food shortages in our near future. But what I do see is like everything else, ingredients are skyrocketing. You know, especially fish meal. So now, if you want, if you, okay, when you're saying food shortages, I think you might mean for people to eat. If we wish to tilt our ponds toward producing more food or food more than, I think you can do both. I think you can do, I think you can have sport fishing and I think you can have food production. And I'm, I'm, I like that question. I'm going to tackle that. But I'm going to go ahead and finish my uh, analogy or my talk uh, comparison with David Nelson. So I said, what, what do you see as some of the issues? He says, well, it, he says, sometimes we have issues with dealers not really understanding about these products enough to, to push when people want to buy it. And then some of them say they can't get it when they really can. But a bigger problem, he says, just on a 30,000 foot level is we have over 270 SKUs just for fish food. And some of the SKUs are for the same food with a different name. He said, but our best sellers are Aquamax 500, 600, and MVP. That's our three best sellers. And how can we get that food out to more people? So I told him I'd, I'd call around and talk to some guys. I called and talked to Jeff Slipke. I talked to, he's with Midwest Lake Management. I called and talked to Greg Grimes. Nate Herman, Greg Grimes is in Georgia, and Nate Herman's in Illinois. And I talked to um, Kevin Bjornson up in Iowa about it. And so they all gave me their, their takes on it. And they're all, all their takes are a little bit different. You know, some of them sell fish food. Some of them refer to the dealers and then wish them luck. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But I don't, I don't see that the uh, fish farm, I mean the fish food market is going to go away. But I can see it, the price is getting so high that we're going to push back on that price a little bit. So you're going to have to justify that, you know. At the same time, the, the price of fish, and this is very interesting to me, the price of fish has not escalated in 25 years until this year. And what's driving that is the cost of fertilizer, the inavailability of adequate amounts of labor, and fish food. So sport fish prices are now starting to go up. They rose 20% this year, which in fairness is a long time coming. That should have happened 10 years ago, in my opinion, but it didn't. So uh, Ron Ardwan's asking about Jacob's Lake. We're going to electrofish Bobby and Jacob's Lake. I talked to Walter today, Jacob, about some dates, and he promised he'd look at some dates and get right back to me. So I'm hoping to have some dates tomorrow and we're going to go shock that lake and see what it looks like. Let's see here. Let me see here. They want to make uh oh, okay. Okay, I see. Okay, so we're having a conversation there. All right. Mike McPherson, Indiana. Good to see you, Justin. My experience with Purina dealers is they, they use that they can't get it, which is an excuse not to do work. That's the truth. That is the truth. Now, there, that you, we can't just blame the dealers because there are times that 
that the, the way that, that Purina has to do now, they sold their extrusion plant in Richmond, Indiana. Or no, I'm sorry, Richmond, Ohio. And so now they outsource it. So when they outsource it to another manufacturer, it has to get in line. So one of the problems is projecting the volume that they need. So that was one of the questions I asked the four guys I called today. Can you project what you need? And then do you have storage capacity to hold it? Two of them do, two of them don't. You know, and so there's one of the, on, on occasion, they will oversell their inventory and then have to put another in line in order at the manufacturer to get it produced, which can result in like a 10 day lag sometimes. Now, that doesn't happen very often, but I've seen that happen. Doug Cusick, somebody turned the wind off in Kansas. Can't keep a hat on my head. Need to spray food plots. No time to fish my pond. Yeah, Doug, I drove through Kansas um, on the way back. On the way, on the way up, I drove up through Oklahoma and then went northeast up into Missouri and then northeast up into Iowa. Man, my Chevy truck was getting 22, 23 miles per gallon <laughs> on the way back last night to, to, today. If I didn't keep it down around 65 miles an hour, it was 16 miles per gallon going into that headwind. You know, so um, I want to go back to Frank James's question. When it, one of the things that I took great pride in at, at Lusk Lodge, comma two, was producing food, and I, I did that mo mostly just because I wanted us to eat food that we could produce because we could. So I had two hatchery ponds where I grew tilapia, and at the end of the year, we would take the young of the year tilapia that were three to five inches long, bring those into a heated room in my workshop that was heated with a wood-fired stove, by the way, so I didn't pay for electricity to heat that room. We put those three to five inch tilapia and spread them out into four 1,000 gallon tanks. Those four 1,000 gallon tanks filtered by gravity into a filter that collected the solids and then I had these had some Matala filter material in it to help break down the ammonia in it. And then on top of that, I had a grow bed where I, I planted little I planted little seedlings under a grow light and then put them in these little cups and set them in holes in styrofoam. And man, those things would just grow like crazy. And from seed to food, 45 days. So I could stagger it. Now that was all greens. I was growing stuff like romaine lettuce, four or five, what, what, what I could grow the best in that room under a grow light was lettuce and four or five different kinds of lettuce. And it was delicious. You know, and so then I also had eight raised bed gardens that I irrigated from one of the ponds. And so I was able to use water from the ponds and we had a well there where I could keep the ponds full and we would grow all the kinds of vegetables and I would can things, you know, we would make salsa and, and uh, can tomatillos and, and grew carrots. I just, you know, we grew vegetables like crazy and we had a chicken house. So we would get anywhere to, at one point, De Debbie, <laughs> on Easter weekend, Debbie loved to take the grandkids that came up for an Easter egg hunt. And one of her events, one of her little field trips is we'd go to a DNL farm store in Salina and let the kids pick out chicks or go to Denton to a, a feed store that had chicks, had chick day. And oh my gosh, one, one Saturday that they were there, Debbie bought 32 chicks, 32 of them. 31 of them made it. Two of them were roosters. So we were getting like two dozen eggs every single day for a while until a predator figured out how to eat some of those chickens. But bottom line was, I would take some of the eggs and barter with the neighbors. Had a next door neighbor. Every once in a while, he'd go shoot a feral hog, and he'd bring me some meat. And I'd take that, take those hams and back strap, you know, cut the back strap up, cook that separate. And then I'd take those hams and grind them into meat and a, a hamburger and make breakfast sausage out of it. You know, so we had a little had a little gig going there. And with fish, I had a catfish pond. And I could feed those catfish an inexpensive feed and they would grow like crazy. I'd put 200 in every year and harvest 100 to 150 out each year. And sometimes that was kids catching them. Sometimes it was saining them. And on a rare occasion, I'd put the shocker boat in and get some 
if I wanted a big batch that I could clean at one time and put them up. So if you wanted to raise some food around your pond, one thing that could be really fun is to create or buy an aquaponic system uh, uh, or maybe just a uh, uh, hydroponic system and you can pump some water using a solar pump and Frank, you're set up for that with the levee between your hatchery pond you know, in your lake. You can actually get a, a solar powered pump that could pump water into a tower type hydroponic system and suck water that's got nutrients in it and let it cascade down through the hydroponics. The problem is you have to keep the wildlife off. You know, we didn't have any issues there with deer. If we tried to do that here, the deer would eat it. You know, so uh, I love Purina Mills. <laughs> Texas Hunter. Hey, I've even got a Texas Hunter hat. I was at my office part of the time last Thursday and Friday and uh, picked up that hat that came in the mail. Texas Hunter, best products out there for feeding fish, feeders, uh, deer blinds, all that kind of stuff. You know, go to texashunterproducts.com and you can see what I'm talking about. David Schneiderman, EZ Docs of Texas, is a sponsor of this show. Check him out. I don't see him on here today, but but I, he usually is. Okay, I'm going to back up a little bit. So let me see here. Stephen Martin. Let's see what Stephen's got. I got the leak sealed up in the bottom of my pond now. It's leaking from the berm built to raise the level on the east side of the pond. Okay, what? You mentioned polymers to seal it. Who do I need to get? Okay, I'll tell you what you do, Stephen, is go to the Palm Boss Forum. Go to Ask the Boss. Go to www.palmboss.com and click on Ask the Boss Forum. And register. It's free. And then find uh, TJ. I think he spells it T-E-E-J-A-E-H. It's TJ Hudson from Lincoln, Nebraska. He is the polymer expert. And you probably are a candidate uh, for that. And Justin, the advice Justin Ludwig, I just saw that. What he's giving you is, is right on. That's basically what I'm telling you to do. Yep, Chris Blood, that is a great looking cap. Who sent that to me? Chris Blood did. <laughs> Jeremy Duckworth, good to see you, buddy. So, uh, uh, let's see, it is 712. I'm a little foggy, as you can imagine. Hit me with some questions. <clears throat> but to go back to the, to the polymer thing, here, Justin, here's the reason that your levee is leaking. Whoever raised the dam did not tie it in to the existing dam properly. Which what that usually means is if, if, if you guys, any of you are going to raise a dam, the proper way to do that is to scrape off the topsoil off the top of the dam, go down a little bit, and then score that soil really, really well, and then bring clay in on top of it and raise it that way. Now, keep in mind, every, if, you, if you're going to have a three-to-one slope on both sides, and I'm just going to talk about this in theory, on the back side, you want it to be softer, but if you're going to have a three-to-one slope on both sides, that means for every foot that you go up, you're going to go six feet out plus the crown. So if you're going to go up four feet, you're going to go, you're going to widen the base of the dam up where you're starting, 24 feet. So you're going to have to tile that in together. But it's got to be, when you're raising it up, you got to mix it with good clay in the dam and then compact it with a sheep's foot roller or a scraper or ha however, not a bulldozer. It needs to be compacted. So now that you have it that way, polymer could be a good candidate for you. But if not, then your next choice is to let the pond drop down and then go back in and dig a core trench along the inside slope of the dam and dig a little ditch and backfill that, backfill that with a combination of compacted clay, maybe with some bentonite and build a, a, an impervious wall down into the existing dam coming up to past the water line of where you, uh, where you did it. Let's see here. Chris Blood, if you were to stock fish in a pond purely for a food source, what species would you choose and why? Uh, there's, there's a couple of ways I would look at that, Chris. And some of this is going to be based on your geography. And some of it's going to base, be based on what's legal in your state. Fred Bingaman cannot do what I'm going to tell you because tilapia are not legal in either Missouri or Illinois. 
But tilapia are an outstanding food source. The problem is, is that they reproduce heavily. So if you wanted to grow tilapia and they're legal in your state, and I know they're legal in Kansas and they're legal in Oklahoma and they're legal in Texas. So you can stock some that are four or five inches long in the spring and you're going to pay 10 to $12 a pound for fish that weigh six or seven per pound. And if you feed them well, you can feed them an inexpensive fish food, have fertile water, and you're going to have tilapia. They're going to range in size from three quarters of a pound to over two pounds a piece. And you're going to have a kajillion babies. Those babies you can take, you know, you got to be able to harvest these fish. You're not going to do it with a hook and line. You got to catch them with a seine. You got to be able to drain the pond and get the fish out with nets. You know, and, and that being the case, you can take those babies, you know, late October and go feed them to your bass. Because when they hit a bass lake there and, and the water temperature starts to, to drop, they're going to get really sluggish and be easy to catch. And in the fall, when you're game fish, whether they're walleye, smallmouth, largemouth bass, whatever, when those tilapia get sluggish, that's the prime operating temperature for those game fish, and they will devour them. So you can kill two birds with one stone there. The most common species of fish to grow for food is channel catfish. And that's because they're easy, they're not expensive to feed, they grow really, really fast. Another choice are hybrid striped bass. You're going to pay a little bit of money for the fingerlings when you buy them, but they grow pretty darn quick as well. They're a good choice for a source of food. Uh, last year and the year before, no, I guess it was the year before, I stocked some freshwater um, Australian uh, shrimp, macrobrachium rosenberga. Those were really, really fun. I think Jacob West was there, Tim Stewart was there when we harvested a bunch of those. Now, when you do that, you better freeze them quick or eat them quick because they eat each other if you try to keep them alive. So those are some of the choices for food fish. I think... My number one go-to choice was uh, uh, channel catfish because you can get a lot of mass. You can take a one-acre pond and you can really, if you, do it, if you do it smartly, not let your water deteriorate, you can grow a 1,000 pounds of catfish in a one-acre pond. And that, with a 1,000 pounds of catfish, you're going to get, um, if you leave the bone in, you're going to get 550 pounds of, of, of fish. If you fillet them, you're going to get probably 400 pounds of fillets. So that's pretty darn good. And, you know, 400 pounds of fillets from a one-acre pond, that's going to last you a year unless you got 16 kids. All right, let's see here. Wesley Ellis, I'm ready to stain my dock. Will an oil-based stain that drops in the water kill the fish? It will not kill the fish. But it does. But what I would do is is because we did that, and the guy that I hired to stain it, he probably spilled a cup of through drift, and then just dripping off the boards of the dock, it had a layer of oil all the way across that pond, and it took it about three days to evaporate out. Some of it blew up against the shore into some. Um, we did it in the fall, and it blew into some leaves, and ended up. A, one of my worker bees and I took a leaf rake and we raked it all out, but it didn't kill the fish. That's your question. I would, what, one thing you, I don't know what your dock looks like, but if he could put, you know, one of those, um, oh, it's a yellow round floating deal that they use for oil spills. That would probably be a pretty smart investment to surround your dock with just so that stain doesn't escape. It, it's, it's not going to kill the fish, but it's not healthy for the pond. If you do it this time of year, you're just as likely to kill part of your bloom as you are to do anything else. And it's just, just not a good practice. And I did it. Didn't think about it, but it happened. Tom Davis, I live in a 40-acre... Uh-oh, I scrolled past it. Let me see here. I live in a 40-acre, 75-year-old private subdivision lake with 14-foot maximum depth and thought to be 6-foot average depth. <clears throat> the lake has a high phosphorus level and a history of HABs. Harmful algae blooms. It is being suggested by our water quality committee that we use nanobubble ozone technology to control harmful algae. I have not been able to study many applications in a lake that size to have an informed opinion. Is this a tool that's being commonly used? That's a tool that's being used. I'm not going to tell you commonly because that tool costs 10 grand. And it's unproven science, 
But I'm real optimistic that it works. And that the way that it works is it expedites. Now, this is, this is my opinion based on the research I've done talking to those that manufacture those systems and those that use them. And I've written about it in Pond Boss last year, the year before I wrote two different articles about that. And I don't like writing something and somebody turns back and says, you're wrong. So I spent several hours on the phone with different experts at different levels, manufacturer and consumers. And I'm, I'm convinced that the technology is sound. What I'm not convinced yet is how effective it is because it's somewhat effective based on its ability to generate the nano bubbles and compared to the volume of the blue green algae that you've got. So those are two variables that they have not figured out yet to my knowledge. They haven't talked to anybody about it probably in a year. But uh, your question is, is it commonly used? No, but it is being used and I am hearing some good stories about it. So uh, I think, I'll tell you what my gut response is to that, Tom, is that that could be a piece of the puzzle. But another piece of the puzzle could be treating that algae, that uh, uh, harmful algal bloom, and trying to reduce your volumes of phosphorus with a product like Foslock or something like that. So I'd be working with a company, you know, which your committee probably is. If they know about nanobubbles, then they should be being educated about all the different pieces of the puzzle. I don't, here's, here's where I'm going to leave it. I don't know that I'm going to believe that nanobubbles by themselves at this stage of the industry is going to be totally effective to control harmful algal blooms. But I do think that they can play a significant role in it with other things. Now, you also, also got to understand, harmful algal blooms, I know this is boring to a lot of you, but this is a pretty important topic because it's spreading nationwide, uh, is because there's an imbalance between phosphorus and nitrogen. And it's not enough nitrogen to balance with the phosphorus to grow the kinds of algae that we want. So the blue-green algae species are able to overwhelm the good algae and outcompete them and then do what they do with their toxins and change the ecosystem and just dominate it. And then, you know, you got warnings and issues and things like that. So I do think a combination of treatments probably would be smarter, but you need to talk to somebody that knows more about it than me. John Dyer, good information on Purina's info. Yep, yep, you're welcome. Hey, Christopher Aguilard, daddy's here. Hey, Weber, you always tell us that it takes 10 pounds of forage to grow one pound of harvest in all levels of the food chain, but did you just tell us a few minutes ago that the food has a three to one conversion rate? No, I'm gonna tell you it's, <clears throat> the, now, most fish foods convert two to one. The Aquamax MVP and that higher protein fish meal based fish food is better than that. It's like 1.3 to one. And I can actually prove with some studies I've done in my own ponds with bluegill that the, that the, that the, that the, that the, uh, the what the hell is it? Conversion. <laughs> the conversion rate's actually less than one to one, but you say, how can that be? It's because they're only feeding part of the day and they're still growing on natural food that's being produced. You know, when a fish eats fish food and gives off waste, something's going to eat the waste, whether it's insects or plants or algae or whatever, which kind of keeps some of that generating in the food chain. You know, and so now here's, here, now here, I know where your question is. How can it be one, how can it be 10 pounds for a pound of gain or 1.3 pounds to a pound of gain? It's because the fish food is dry. The bait fish are not. If you were to take that 10 pounds of bait fish and wring them out like a wash rag, there'd be about eight pounds of water, two pounds of goodies. And then when you extrapolate the amount of energy that that fish that ate that 10 pounds had to go through to get it and then digest it, that's where the 10 to one comes from. Dave, I know I was pretty close to you last night because I came over from northeastern uh, uh, Missouri and came west up north of the interstate. And then I hit Interstate 35 around Polo or somewhere. 
But, and I thought about calling you, but I didn't think you'd answer the phone at 1130. <laughs> I know I wouldn't have. Well, I don't know. If you'd have called me, I would have answered you. Maybe you would have. I didn't call. Jeff Miller. Have a very old spring-fed pond with significant sediment. Is bacteria and aeration worth it? Also, what's the best additive for care or control? Those are good questions. I'm going to spend some time on that. I'm going to look down below that and see what else there is. Hello, Buddy Floyd. I had a great talk with Buddy yesterday. Buddy builds lakes in northern Mississippi, not too far from Memphis. And, man, I'm telling you, that guy, he is on fire about these ponds and lakes and fish habitat and stuff. Containment boom. That's it. Ken Weber, good stuff. Richard Barrett, can you tell us a bit more on the beach? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll talk about that here in just a second. Let's see. R.E. Thompson has got it. Gary Oborn got it. Stephen Martinez got it. Good. Okay, so now um, I'm going to go down here. Okay, let's talk about the sediment for a minute, and then I'm going to hit the beach, so to speak. <laughs> um. Is bacteria and aeration worth it? I'm going to tell you, yes, it is. Now, what I'm also going to tell you is that doesn't mean it's going to decrease the amount of sediment. Now, what aeration and bacteria will do is it will expedite na nature's process to consume the organic matter that is part of that sediment. So if you've got a lot of grass clippings, leaves, you know, um, the wind blew in a bunch of corn stubble, <laughs> whatever, if you've got organic matter that's that's a, a, a segment of that sediment, then aeration is going to help reduce that and diminish it. And it may it may only reduce your sediment volume by 10%, but that's a significant 10%. But if that sediment is mostly organic matter, it'll reduce it more significantly. So it depends on how much of the sediment's dirt and how much of it's organic matter. It's not going to do anything with the dirt except stir it up, let it settle out again. But what happens is, is the decomposition of organic matter in the bottom of a pond requires oxygen. It, it, it's aerobic. When it goes anaerobic, it stalls out. It doesn't decompose nearly as rapidly as when it's got oxygen. Going back to the nanobubble question, one of the things about nanobubbles that everybody was excited about at first was if you could aerate the bottom strata of dead water in a pond, you can energize it with enough oxygen that fish can live in it, which gives you a cold water fishery all over the nation, you know, in, in ponds. But in fact, what happens is those nanobubbles that go in and they're consumed so quick by the biological oxygen demand that it doesn't really elevate the oxygen enough, long enough, and keeps it up there long enough for, for it to be able to be predictably effective for fish. You know, and so what's happening with aeration as you're taking your water and moving it vertically and stirring it and allowing it to mix with the, the interface between the water and the pond bottom and speed up that process. And what the bacteria does is it expedites that process. Now, all, all the bacteria you need are in your pond, but if you want to speed the process up, consider using that bacteria. So there you go. There's that one. Um, let's see here. Richard Barrett. Can you tell us a bit more on the beach? Yep. There's a video right below here. And this is about a, I don't know, five or six acre lake there in northeastern Missouri where I was yesterday. And I'll put some more pictures up for that on that here in a minute. But what he decided to do is he wanted to have a beach for his, uh, his adult kids and his grandkids to be able to enjoy. So what he did was, and, and he is in the erosion control business. So he works with a lot of golf courses and subdivisions and, you know, uh, uh, highway right-of-ways, things like that. So I, 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 his nickname from his employees is Mr. Overkill. And I think that all the letters in Overkill are capitalized for him. So what he did there was he, he created a beach. He laid out geotextile cloth on the slope. And then he brought in sandy gravel. So the gravel are really small pieces, but it's mostly sand. And in the Midwest, there's a lot of beaches that are made of pea gravel. So then he took riprap, which is about, the you'll see in that video, uh, that riprap is maybe baseball size to volleyball size. And he built a trough that looks like a flume all the way around it. 
and he fixed it to where if any water falls on it, it's going to have to go through the rocks and around the riprap to get into the lake so it doesn't wash the sand away from the beach. And so his goal is, is after the, after the, the lake fills up and he gets that slope um, vegetated well, then he's going to take that rock flume and spread it out flatter and put a little walkway across it so people barefooted aren't going to be walking on those big old rocks. But that's what he did. It's pretty darn cool. Danny Mac, I read that blue-green algae blooms are seen to occur where copper-based algae sides are used. I don't know that that is an absolute truth, but I can see where algae blooms can respond quickly after copper. I don't think copper, uh, copper-based copper algae sides don't cause uh, a blue-green algae bloom, but what they can do is facilitate it especially if the timing's wrong. So when you take out, because copper-based blooms, copper-based algae sites will kill harmful algal blooms as well. You know, and so what happens is, is that when you take out a plankton bloom and the conditions are right for the blue-greens, they'll respond more quickly and come in and be the dominant stuff that's growing in it. So that's how that can happen. Hey, Ben Ship, guess what you did? You won... You won the drawing this week. So you're going to get a Palm Boss hat and you're going to get a little cooler, a uh, Kanga cooler from Easy Docs. So if you're not a subscriber to Palm Boss, email your mailing, your shipping address to info at pondboss.com. Ian Swinger, banger, uh, bacteria for the ponds, are they all the same? They're not. The different bacteria, i tell you what, look up Aquafix and uh, Natural Lake. Look up those two online. Those guys will take samples of your water or your plants and they will analyze that and they create a custom blend of bacteria suited for your water environment. So they'll look at your water chemistry. They'll look at, they'll have you preserve the contents to see what kind of algaes you've got, what kind of paraphyton you've got. And then they'll create an enzyme or they'll uh, create a bacteria blend just for your pond. So that's the way that works. Well, look at there, it's 7.32. We busted through another hour. I am so glad we got to hang out together. And um, I, I think I'm going to be home next week. I did a whole lot of miles in the last few days, and I got to give a speech tomorrow and then go do an electrofishing survey with, with some guys on Friday. And then after that, I'm going to shut down for a few days and maybe do a little riding. So, hey, I always appreciate y'all hanging out. And uh, appreciate you clicking like, putting a little heart thing up there. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. 35 bucks a year, guys. I'm going to remind you. Some of you have been subscribing. I see it. When, when somebody subscribes online, I get an alert. Leanne processes it. And I really want to tell you how much I appreciate you guys doing that. So, there's your... Uh, there's the knowledge for the day. Hope I'm right. See you all next Sunday. Hey, Elena, Miranda, oh, you don't have to go to bed yet. Go fishing. Bye.